Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, and I really enjoy speaking to him. He is one of my favorite interviewees. He is editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report and one of the best distressed asset contrarian value investors for decades now. Dr. Mark Faber, thank you for coming back on. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on your program. So, Mark, in your opinion, how many more rate hikes do you think the Fed can get away with before they start breaking a lot of these different asset classes and credit markets? Well, uh, you say before they start breaking asset markets. I think uh, a lot of asset markets have already broken. If you look at the meme stocks uh, that were rising in 2020, until January, February 2021. If you look at the ARC Innovation Fund, which was kind of the darling of young investors and uh, Kathy Wood was kind of the new messiah that would bring eternal wealth to the Generation Z. Uh, they have broken down a lot. They're down 70, 80% from the highs, these stocks uh, that had never a chance to make any money, but they were promoted nicely by the altruistic Wall Streets and uh, the altruistic promoters uh, that uh, launched uh, all kinds of uh, prognostications on Reddit, the Reddit crowd. So there, there has been a bear market. There has been a bear market in treasury bonds. In Europe, some bonds are down 50% from the highs, not junk bonds, government bonds. And the treasury bond, uh, say if you look at the TLT ETF, it's down like 40% from the high in, uh, I think it was July, 2020. So we have actually had already a bear market or what I would call the first phase of the bear market. Some people call this uh, a low that from where the bull market will reassert itself. I don't think we are yet there for the simple reason that valuations are still at an extremely high level. And so I expect the second phase of a bear market and then the third phase, the desperation phase, with or without the Fed doing anything. Because the long-term bond market actually would take comfort from a tightening Fed, which would imply that the Fed is actually concerned about inflation. So far, they've only been mm -hmm. talking. Uh, they haven't done anything about inflation. And the Biden administration, in its complete incompetence, is actually aggravating the inflationary trends. And we've already had a bear market rally. But Mark, you've been through a lot of bull markets. You've been through a lot of bear markets. These bear market rallies, it seems to me that when stocks do rally, it's short covering and then there's even more selling pressure. So just because stocks are rallying and we see a 9% or 10% rally in some of these NASDAQ stocks or some of these meme stocks or tech stocks does not mean that the bear market is over. Well, if a stock drops from 100 to 10 and then it rallies to 20, and then Wall Street applauds and says, oh, the bear market is over. Great rally, 100% rally. Yeah, but you're still down 80% from the highs. And I want to give you two examples. These are not hot stocks. These are viable companies, Target and Walmart. They dropped sharply about three weeks ago on poor earnings because they said that they were cost pressures and so forth and so on. Today, they're again weak because Target admitted that they will have huge inventory markdowns. Now, what does an inventory markdown mean? It means that demand was very disappointing for certain goods. 
And I suspect this disappointing uh, announcement for the investment community, disappointing, is due to the fact that we are already in recession. There was a survey carried out yesterday and uh, the majority of Americans actually think we are in recession. Not Wall Street and not <laughs> the eternally optimistic economists that have failed to predict either the accelerating inflation or the uh, recessions in the last 40 years. All the economists are basically kind of a promoting a group of people that uh, have failed to add anything to the prosperity of the United States. In fact, they've done it, they've aggravated economic and financial conditions by constantly, and I repeat, constantly applauding when the Fed was easing. None of these economies has ever warned of the uh, devastating impact of money printing on society as a whole, on lower income groups, and on uh, enriching the wealthy that already own assets that benefit from money printing. They never pointed this out. They will point it out when everything looks bad and then they start to point their fingers at this one. Now the Biden administration and Yellen and all these completely incompetent bureaucrats that are overpaid and ripping off taxpayers, they blame Putin for everything. <laughs> you have to really laugh that first they engineer COVID blame everything on COVID. Now COVID is kind of over or the public is gradually waking up to the fraud it was. And now they blame <laughs> Putin for every evil. Yeah, they're blaming him for inflation too, even though the inflation, look at the money supply growth that the US has had in the last three or so years, all the official Fed money supply numbers are up enormously. Correct. But you understand, I want to make this very clear to all your viewers and listeners that an increase in money supply would lead to inflation and a decrease in money supply leads to deflationary trends was explained in all details and repeatedly hundreds of times by the man these Fed officials admired the most, Bernanke, Yellen, all, they all applauded Milton Friedman. But that is his theory that uh, inflation is a monetary phenomenon, which it is largely, largely. I wouldn't say that in every case, every price is due to monetary conditions. But in general, the higher you have an increase in the quantity of money, the higher prices will go. And this, these Fed geniuses, I have to point out geniuses uh, because they only study, do you understand? They're better than ordinary people who work. They were born into a society of, as Yellen said, I come from an academic background, yes? I'd like to fe say FS, academic background. I like to have someone at the Fed who has worked a single day in his life in a private enterprise, not academics. The academics, they will ruin the world. They will destroy the world because they never work. They don't know what a balance sheet is of an individual that he has to earn money, that he has to pay salaries, that he has to fight with the government every day for survival. That these academics don't understand. They don't even know what shopping is because they never shop for themselves. They send an employee, their drivers or whatnot. Yeah, I completely agree. And if 
There and was they sit there, and this the greatest, I mean, the U.S. is lucky that there are even greater idiots in Europe and in Japan. In Europe, Lagarde, who is in charge of the ECB, of course, she was not elected by ordinary people, but put in place by a corrupt bureaucracy at uh, the European Union in Brussels. Now she says, until recently, repeatedly, oh, inflation is transitory. And as inflation picked up already a year ago, the ECB and the Bank of Japan and the Federal Reserve, they kept on buying assets last year. Everybody can see home prices were up 20% on average in the U.S., medium home prices. But they keep on buying mortgages to make it go higher, <laughs> even higher. Yeah, I mean, someone with some common sense is shaking his head. He can't believe this immense stupidity by these, elect by these non-elected bureaucrats. So do you think then that U.S. home prices will crash if mortgage rates continue to rise and the Fed continues to hike interest rates? Well, uh, <laughs> this is a <laughs> we have to ask the Federal Reserve because they could hike interest rates and at the same time they could continue to buy assets. Uh, it would be a complete contradiction, but they could do that. Or they can subsidize housing. This is another big source of inflation, our federal deficits. This has also been observed already for the last 50 years hmm. in the bureaucracy. They also overlooked that. Did you see that last month the Fed actually bought another around $230 billion in assets and they moved them off balance sheet? And then their official balance sheet on Thursday, they actually said it, it was reduced, even though they bought mortgage-backed securities and other toxic garbage, and it looks like they stuck them off balance sheet in a special purpose vehicle now. Well, you have to also see the connection between Wall Street, BlackRock, and uh, the Federal Reserve. <laughs> if you have something that is really toxic, uh, you shuffle it into the Federal Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been that way since 2008. Oh, the, ECB. the ECB is even more convenient. It's run by an even dumber bureaucrat. Wasn't the ECB paying over 100 cents on the dollar for some European corporate bonds and some European Union government debt? Well, for sure they, yeah, because they had negative interest rates. So they bought some assets at uh, much higher prices, obviously. So I want to talk about U.S. government finances because the Fed is still threatening to hike interest rates, but I think the, the Federal Reserve Bank has a math problem, especially if we're in a recession, because normally in a recession, that means a lot lower income tax revenues, capital gains tax revenues, lower capital gains tax revenues, lower property tax revenues. Do you think the Federal Reserve, excuse me, do you think the U.S. federal government can actually afford interest rates above 3%? This is uh, the crux of the matter. Uh, today, with the level of government debt at such a high level, it becomes problematic for many governments if interest rates would go to 3%. Uh, so the Japanese solved the problem by taking interest rates at 0.25% or lower. But they had to now uh, take in account that their currency has collapsed. The yen is at the 20-year low. Now, they claim they have no inflation. Well, if the yen continues to weaken, they'll get inflation. And nobody can tell me that in Japan, the price of gasoline didn't go up and the price of food didn't go up and so forth. And if they travel now, the Japanese will have to pay a little bit more for the holidays in Vietnam or in Hawaii or wherever. Uh, so in my opinion, 
the central banks and the governments have also this ability and this willingness. We have to see this, this evil trait of lying to the public. They don't tell you what the real rate of inflation is. They understate inflation massively. And so my sense is that uh, in Japan, the day will come when they have to actually interest, increase interest rates the same way in the US. If they want the bond market to perform well, they either need a severe recession or they need to tighten considerably, which also brings about a recession. And Japan is also getting killed the last 18 months or so because they have to import so many raw materials and commodities. And we've had this absolute skyrocketing of energy prices, base metal prices were up a lot. So Japan to manufacture value added goods, they have to, because they don't have a lot of oil and gas drilling and mining in their own country, they have to import all the all these raw materials. <laughs> they have zero oil in their own country. Now they are Japanese companies, you know, Japanese oil companies. They have interest in oil wells around the world, but themselves, they have to import the oil. And so, yes, uh, the cost of energy in Japan is going up. But as I said, uh, in the Japanese have one advantage. They can go into recession and uh, the GDP per capita could go up because their population is shrinking rapidly. <laughs> this is one of the few countries in the world where actually the population is really going down. So I want to transition now to commodities. Do you think that commodities are still in a long-term bull market? I think we have to be careful about this premise because uh, in my view, commodities probably will continue to go up irregularly. Because you look, say, at the price of lumber. What does the price of lumber have in common with the price of cocoa or coffee? Very little. Each one is dependent on other consumers and on other factors of production. So we could have a bull market in some commodities and the bear market in other commodities. My sense is that uh, with the policies of the US concerning oil, the shortages of oil will persist. In other words, I don't see oil collapsing like in March 2020. To actually, the oil price was at, for a day or two negative in minus territory. It's hard to believe, but this is true. This is the stability that central banks bring about, <laughs> negative pricing. Anyway, I think that oil could go down to maybe $80 is not my expectation, but I'm just saying it could if we are in a depression type of scenario, which I personally uh, think uh, could happen. I was just looking again at Milton Friedman, one of his speeches, and he blamed the Fed for their inaction to increase the quantity of money during the Depression. Okay, we can debate about this uh, reason for the Depression. There were other reasons as well. But he said, for sure, They'll mess it up once again in future, but in another way. And here we have the other way. We have now inflation. In Germany, we have the highest inflation ever post Second World War. And energy prices, and we're recording this interview on Tuesday, June 7th, 2022. We have West Texas Intermediate and Brent crude, both over $120 a barrel. Does not look like oil prices are going to be lower over the long term. There looks like serious supply side problems. So in your opinion, Mark, how serious are the food and energy problems globally? <laughs> that depends, again, on uh, uh, politics. 
As you know, the U.S. blames high oil prices on Putin and food shortages on Putin. Some for food shortages like this uh, baby formula stuff. I mean, I'm a, I'm a man. I never heard of this baby formula before in my life. But if you analyze, why did it happen? It happened because the government, the FDA, but the FDA and the government is the same. They closed down a facility. In America, baby formula is produced, I think, by three companies. Abbott Labs is one of them. I wouldn't buy for my baby's food from any U.S. healthcare company in a million years. It's all poison that they sell. But uh, this is the fact. And then uh, Abbott corrected its mistakes or whatever was wrong. But then the Fed, the FDA delayed the opening <laughs> of the factory. Now, again, you, you see nowadays there's the business and there's the government. You don't know whether Abbott actually deliberately did not want to open the factory to push up prices and create shortages or the FDA did it, or both of them, or both were incompetent. We don't know. But now they blame, of course, Putin, and they say, well, he is preventing food from leaving uh, Ukraine. Well, to some extent, this is true. But the U.S. wanted to make him default on his debts, and they kicked him out of SWIFT, and they don't want to allow him to pay the interest on the government debt, and so forth and so on. You understand that the measures that the U.S. is undertaking with NATO and the vassals at the EU, the, the EU is basically doing what the U.S. is telling them to do. They have no backbone. And uh, so they are pushing Putin in a corner. And I'm not saying he's a nice man, but is Biden a nice man? Is Trump a nice man? Were the Bushes nice people? No, they're all the same. Politicians, by definitions, are evil people. Amen. I 100% agree with you. But Mark, it's we're seeing protectionist policies from a lot of different countries now we're seeing a uh wheat ban from Indi india banned their wheat it wasn't so ukraine did to russia before i think back in february they banned fertilizer exports and there's a lot of other countries now that are basically closing their borders to either fertilizer exports or wheat or other staple crops what what type of devastation is this going to cause to emerging markets in developing countries where if the price of wheat or the price of soybeans or the price of rice or corn or other like basic stable crops that goes up 20, 30%. I mean, that's the difference between no food on the table. I'm telling you, and I've written about this. I've sent pictures of famine uh, in, the, on the, in the British Empire and so forth to my readers. Uh, this is a problem. But as I said, it's created by interventionists. It's not created by ordinary people. It's not created by the market. We have, for the last 200 years, had essentially a philosophy, an economic philosophy of free markets, free trade, and the capitalistic system. But this didn't fit some people. I call them the elite, the people that say go to Davos. They think they're smarter than anybody else that they should rule the world and tell the, the world what to do, and they intervene into the economy. Now, under Trump, regulation went down somewhat. He's also an interventionist, but he's not as bad as the interventionists of the Biden administration, who are not only interventionists, but complete idiots. They have no knowledge about anything. Look at some of the ministers Biden has. It's a horrible show. It's embarrassing, um, the corruption here in the United States. I live right outside of Washington, D.C. for over 20 years now, but we... We should just focus on investing topics because it'll it'll get very 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 bad yes, about but all the. Do you understand the investment world today is 
more complex because you have all these interventions. Uh, Hayek said that the more the government plans, the more difficult it is for the individual to plan. And this is the case now that uh, we don't know what the government will do next, but I can tell you something. These protectionist measures, they were started largely in America, sadly under the Trump administration. Now, if you're India and you have fertilizer and you have shortages and you have wheat, but there are shortages in the world, what do you do first to look, you have to look after your own people. We are essentially in a world where we still have national interests. And uh, the sanctions against Russia exacerbated the problems of supplies that we already had due to COVID. It's like the people that closed down the economy and declared all the lockdowns. Nobody knows whether the lockdowns were of any use because in Sweden they didn't have any lockdowns and the economy was doing well. But the big fallacy about lockdowns is that the economy is like a light switch in your living room. When you come home, you switch it on and when you go out, you switch it off. The economy, when you close it down the way they lock down everything, close down small shops and so forth and so on, has very uh, unfavorable adjustments with the result that when you reopen the world to say traveling, you ease travel restrictions, then people want to travel, but then the airlines don't have enough staff. That is the problem. But this the interventionists never thought about. The interventionists only think about one thing. How can I get a higher compensation? How can I get a higher salary? Because the government salaries always go up. Whether the economy is good or bad. Whether the deficit is large or small. They also trade on inside information for stocks and bonds here in Washington, D.C. too. Well, that is, that, <laughs> that is the smallest crime they commit. That is really the smallest crime. I would focus on the big corruption. And it's unbelievable. And, uh, you know, now the SEC is coming out and saying, well, they will now make it more difficult to front run the retail clients. Well, what they've done is, you know, companies like Charles Schwab and Robin Hood and so forth, the main money they made is by selling the order flow to hedge funds like Citadel and others. So the hedge fund, he sees the order flow in, say, 100 different stocks by the Reddit crowd, the Robin Hood crowd and so forth. They can front run these people. The That's where they make the money. Yeah, the average person doesn't understand how Wall Street and the large corporations play the game. Do you, do you think that we'll see two hundred dollar a barrel oil in the next couple of years? Well, if I look at the stupidity also of the environmentalists whose aim was to close down all nuclear power, nuclear power is now the energy. That is the cleanest energy, the most efficient energy. But this is not good enough for the uh, Greens. The Greens want to shut down fossil, fu fossil fuels. And uh, the fossil fuel, uh, it creates pollution, admittedly, natural gas more than oil and coal. But uh, I'd say to power the u.s always windmills <laughs> you will have to have windmills all over the place in every in i would suggest to these green communists put some windmills in the midst of beverly hills then you know how nice it is to be next to a windmill well there's a bunch of them in palm springs On Wilshire well. boulevard and hollywood boulevard put 
a row of windmills. That will show you how nice it is. <laughs> yeah, something tells me they're going to be not in my backyard. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, they, well, that is, the you know, today there was a very interesting <laughs> announcement. They want to introduce a carbon tax on airlines, okay, in the EU. But who is exempt <laughs> from this carbon tax? Private planes. <laughs> the ones that go to Davos, that got wants to flow to the environmental conference in Glasgow, all these private planes should be exempt from a carbon tax. <laughs> the carbon tax is for everybody, for ordinary people like you and me and uh, the lower middle class, but not for the people who actually would be able to afford it best, the ones that fly around in private planes. <laughs> uh, the, the, the same people who got the rules changed when they're flying around in private jets and then they, they put their uh, artwork in a vault at the airport. And technically, since it was at the airport, they didn't have to pay taxes when they moved it from one country to another. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, Mark, as we wrap up the interview here, I have a couple of questions on contrarian value investing. Are there any specific sectors or countries for stocks where you see really good value right now as a contrarian investor? Yes, uh, I think that emerging economies offer some value. Now, some have performed well in the last three months. You know, I had a stock group that was the Jardins Group. They're all listed in Singapore. And they were very inexpensive, selling at half the asset value. And the asset value were relatively attractive companies, uh, Hong Kong land, dairy farm, and then also PT Astra in Indonesia and the Siam City Cement in Thailand. So they were selling at half uh, the value of these companies and they're buying some of these. One got taken uh, out through uh, the family bought it uh, at an 80% premium thereafter. <coughs> and one has just gone up now by more than 60% in three months. So. Value has actually already had a good move. I'd say, I think that uh, gold equities are quite uh, reasonable at this level and silver and especially platinum. And then I see some value in telecommunication stocks, in Latin American stocks. And I think if you're uh, someone wealthy, you have to think, if I invest, in America, Britain, Canada, Australia, I'm in the same jurisdiction, the US. Same would apply for Europe. So to diversify, I need to have some money in a non-American alliance jurisdiction. Singapore is kind of middle, but Hong Kong would be a Chinese jurisdiction. <laughs> so. I suggest that actually people in the diversification diversify out of the US. I think eventually the US dollar will go down a lot, a lot, but it hasn't happened yet. But as with the yen, you know, such so things can take a long time. Our friends, they were bearish about the yen 10 years ago. It took 10 years to really weaken. So as we wrap up here, I have one question on fertilizer stock. So they had a big run for a while. Fertilizer prices have come down a little bit in the last six or so weeks. The fertilizer stocks, they have rising costs with higher natural gas prices, higher energy inputs. Do you think that these companies will do well in the future for investors for exposure to a global food crisis if this continues over the next two, three, four, five years with higher food prices? Do you think that that's going to benefit the fertilizer companies with raising prices? Yes, but I think before they rise again, I think they could move lower. I mean, I recommended uh, about three years ago, and some people then told me, why would you recommend something that will never move, like mosaic and uh, 
Bongi. BG is the symbol. Oh, bungee. And yeah. Bungee, yes, you call it bungee. We call it Bunge because the family is from Germany originally. Bunge Bamberg. Anyway, the stock then performed very well. It's still a very inexpensive stock. But as I said, I think there's so many uncertainties uh, about also windfall profit taxes. What an absurdity in an oil <laughs> shortage environment. They want to penalize oil companies. They should be encouraged to invest, but not penalize. But this is, as I said, we have lost sight of what brought prosperity to the US, namely a market economy, a very competitive country in a capitalistic economy, and we've turned it into an empire of folks and brain-damaged people who don't know what a man is and don't know what a woman is. I agree. And we have, um, with the windfall profits taxes and the rules changes from politicians and central banks and governments and all these covert bailouts and then lying about inflation being transitory with all this, just it's not just the US. All these other governments and central banks printed an enormous amount of money the last two and a half years or so. But if the, the oil industry, Mark, it was not profitable the majority of years in the last decade. So when the oil industry actually is profitable and making free cash flow, here we are, the politicians want to sabotage it, want to literally take a baseball bat and hit it in the kneecaps. <laughs> That's why I'm telling you, these people are not sane. We're living in, a, in an asylum where the guards are worse than the inmates. <laughs> Or, or as I call Washington, D.C., now the District of Criminals. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a good, this is an excellent description of what it is. But they are not honorable criminals and courageous criminals like Al Capone. They are cowards. They let others do their crimes for them. They're cowards. Whereas well, Capone... He risked his life every day. Well, the criminals here in DC, Mark, they're mostly lawyers. <laughs> they have law degrees. They all, almost all have law degrees from prestigious law schools. <laughs> <laughs> the media is also criminal when you really think about it because uh, their biased reporting is just stupid. No argument for me there. The mainstream financial media was repeating. Uh, they still repeat pretty much everything the Federal Reserve Bank says. They were repeating for 18 months that inflation was only transitory. When, when you and I knew that it was going to be worse and there was going to be really bad stagflation Absolutely. and other problems. Absolutely. Well, Mark, I really enjoyed our conversation today. If my listeners want to sign up for your newsletter, how do they do so? Well, they can uh, go on my website, uh, gloomboomdoom.com. All in one word, gloom, boom, doom. So you can see I ha still have a boom there. <laughs> well, we might we might have a boom then in uh, food and energy then in the years to come. And I think like at some point in the next maybe six to 12 months, some of these gold stocks are going to bottom. We're starting to see some nice mergers and acquisitions with the lower cost gold miners <laughs> and the good royalty assets. There's starting to be some acquisitions now in the gold space. Yes. I mean, I'm not the market timer in gold. I just buy all the time some gold, and I have a lot of gold. I don't even... I watch the price every day for the market action and so forth. But my gold, I will never sell it unless I have to. But my concern is that the government will take it away one day. There are going to be a lot of rules changes going forward. I mean, look at all the new legislation coming out about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and governments are already moving forward, all these central bank digital currencies. So they don't, uh, at some point they may ban or tax Bitcoin and these other private cryptos or open source cryptos to death because the governments want their government cryptos. Absolutely. That is the issue. Well, thank you very much for your time, <laughs> Jason. Yeah, I enjoyed nice. our just. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mark. I always enjoy our discussions, and hopefully, you'll come back on again in the near future. 
Thank you very much. With pleasure. Bye-bye, Jason.